I cannot think of a better song to sing than on a weekend like this. Our first weekend in this kind of new but hopefully temporary reality. And so, you know, welcome. I know you're welcomed already, but welcome for all of you, <laughs> almost all of you who are watching from home or wherever you are. Uh, you know, we're blessed to be able to uh, come into your environment uh, via live stream. We're here in the worship center and uh, where we meet at least one of our gatherings uh, every week. And I said this on the, on the video that I sent to our whole church on Thursday night, but I meant it and I feel it right now. I cannot even tell you how much I miss you already. You know, I was thinking about this week, the, the church is meant to be in an organic community. I hope we all understand that. And by organic, I mean both physical in nature, emotional in nature, spiritual in nature. I mean, we, we are made that way by God and we're meant to be together. And obviously we can't always be together like right now for good reason with the COVID-19 virus, but that doesn't mean that we don't miss each other tremendously. And I, as your pastor, uh, miss many of you. Well, actually, okay, I miss all of you, but you know what I mean by that. And, and so uh, we're continuing in our series here on the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, you know, we're just going to follow along through the Bible the way God has been leading us. I, I didn't plan it this way, but the the, the first weekend in this new reality where you're sitting right now in your living room or wherever you are uh, watching this or worshiping with us online, uh, the topic ha happens to be one of the most difficult topics of all. I, I mean, really, it, it's tucked away in the Lord's Prayer here, but it is so difficult. It's the topic of forgiveness. I, I mean, think about it. Everything that we've covered so far in the Lord's Prayer though challenging, it is not all that difficult. Uh, things like, you know, our Father, that's wonderful to be able to say, you know, who is in heaven, holy, hallowed be your name, thy will, or thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then we get to this, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. It is one of the most difficult, difficult lines in all of the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to pray right now because we're going to need it as we make sense of what Jesus is saying here and most importantly apply it to our lives. So wherever you are right now and the few people here in the worship center, we have just a few here of our staff and tech guys all six feet apart. Why don't you guys bow with me right now and let's pray. Father God, we do indeed thank you for your goodness and for your grace. Even in trying times, even in difficult times, God, times like now, we're still very, very grateful for your grace, your blessings, and all that you mean to us. And though, Lord, we can't be with each other physically right now as the church, we know two things. One, God, you are with us. Wherever we might be right now, you are with us. Your, your omnipresence and your special presence in Jesus and the Holy Spirit are with us right now. And Lord, we also know that we're with each other in spirit as we now open up your word and talk about the very words of Jesus here, the, these all important words on this idea of forgiveness. Father, if truth be known, there are many of us here today that struggle with this idea of forgiveness. We have people and things in our lives that have been very difficult for us to process and especially process in such a way that we let go and, and move on. And so, Lord, especially for those of us who might be stuck in our hurt, stuck in our anger, whatever it might be for us, God, <clears throat> speak to us, I pray, in a special way through the words of your Son, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray and we all say together, Amen. So I've kind of already hinted to this, but if ever the saying easier said than done is true, it's with this idea of forgiveness. I love how Elizabeth O'Connor says it. This is a 
great quote. She says, despite a hundred sermons on forgiveness, we do not forgive easily, nor find ourselves easily forgiven. She says, forgiveness, we discover, is always harder than the sermons make it out to be. And it's really true. I've preached so many sermons on forgiveness. And if ever the saying, easier said than done, is true, it's when you're giving a sermon on forgiveness. And what you guys need to know is that I understand that. I get that. I get that it's a lot easier for me to preach than for all of us to apply. And the reason is, is because forgiveness is an incredibly tall order. I mean, it's hard precisely because it's really a tall order to ask somebody to let go of a deep hurt or wound against them simply because another person feels bad about it or feels sorry for it or even says, I'm sorry. When you think about it, forgiveness is a radical, even a senseless thing uh, that God has asked us to do. And just so we're clear, I'm not talking about the easy, simple kind of forgiveness that many people feel good about in culture today. You know, where somebody cuts you off in traffic and you say, hey, I'm in a godly mood, I'll let go of that one. Or or, or say somebody has 11 items in the 10 item line at the grocery store, you know, and you say, well, okay, I'm in a good mood, I'll let go of that one. Or my favorite is, you know, like you're watching the movie Iron Man and and somebody says to you, hey, did you know that Robert Downey Jr. was once in drug rehab? And you go, well, that kind of sullies it, but I'll let go of that one, even though he didn't do anything to you. You see, there's lots of things that we tend to let go of today that are either small things or, quite frankly, meaningless things, and we feel good about that and think we're forgiving. No, I'm talking about the big stuff, that almost all of us have a tremendously difficult time forgiving. Someone gossips maliciously about you and backbites your character. That's a hard one to let go of. Uh, Someone pits a friend or a family member against you. Uh, That's a hard one to let go of. Uh, Someone steals a portion of your inheritance. I can't tell you how many counseling sessions I've done over the years on that one with people. That's a hard one to let go of. How about this? Somebody hurts your spouse or one of your children. That's a hard one to let go of. Someone lies to you. Someone betrays a deeply held trust or, or probably the most difficult, somebody abuses is you, abused or abuses you, deeply hurts you either physically or emotionally. See, these are the types of things that are really hard to forgive. These are the things that God is most concerned about. I mean, some of us would rather do just about anything else than have to go through the tunnel of chaos of forgiving people for things like these. And yet here's the rub, and you can't escape it. And that that is that it's precisely this kind of forgiveness that God calls each and every one of us to who have been even glanced by his grace. We're going to see that today. It's core in Jesus' words that he says God has forgiven us. And the expectation now is that we are the kind of people, followers of Jesus, who reach deep and make it a lifelong journey to now forgive even those who have wounded us most deeply. Maybe look at it this way. The very heart of the Christian truth claim, the heart of the Christian message is that we've all sinned against God and that in Jesus Christ, God has provided a pathway for our forgiveness of our sin and eternal life. It's really core to the Christian truth claim. And so God expects us now to carry that same mindset and attitude and action into the world around us. And this brings us then today to the Lord's Prayer. Because as we've already noted, tucked away in the Lord's Prayer is a line about forgiveness. Now, you got to grab onto this that has rattled many people over the years. I'm telling you, I've studied this prayer a lot over the years, and nobody has a problem with any other parts of the Lord's Prayer except this line. Think about it. Who's got a problem with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name? That's wonderful. You know, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. But then we get to this one. And I've never heard anybody pray this in a robust fashion. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Nobody ever prays it like that. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, it's that middle part that a lot of people struggle with when you think about it. 
It's that middle part that presents some problems. And so let's look at it right now. I'm going to bring it up here on the monitor and have us look at black and white at the words of Jesus here. And before I, I, I reference that for you and bring it up, I, I, I want to make a comment here. And that's that I'm going to be reading from verse 12. That the Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. And I'm going to be reading right now verse 12. We're almost to the tail end of the Lord's Prayer. But you've noticed, you're going to notice that I've added verses 14 and 15 on to this. And some of you might say, what's that about? This is kind of a cool factoid about Jesus and the Lord's Prayer. Verses 14 and 15 are Jesus' words that he has said right after the Lord's Prayer. And when you read them, as we will in a second here, in context, you realize that what he's doing, you got to love Jesus about this, is that he's giving an addendum to the Lord's Prayer, he's clarifying one line in the Lord's Prayer that he feels needs clarifying. And so if ever an addendum, clarifying words are important, it's these words. So you're going to see what I mean by this. Look at the passage here, Matthew 6, verse 12, and then we're going to do verse 13 next week, and that's the end of the Lord's Prayer. But then Jesus gives us verses 14 and 15. So let's read 12, 14, and 15 together. Here's what he says. And we pray, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then he says, for if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Whoa. You almost wish Jesus didn't add these clarifying verses this addendum to this prayer. So here's what we need to wrestle with. What is Jesus saying here? Because let's be honest, gang, these words almost seem contradictory to everything else we know about the gospel. I mean, if you didn't know the Bible any better, what it seems like Jesus is saying here is that he's holding God's forgiveness of us over our heads, and he's only going to give it if we forgive other people. The face value, that seems to be what he's saying. The only problem with that is that that would go against the entire message of the gospel. Because the entire message of the gospel is that he has forgiven us through Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross for us and that it's not by works. We can't earn it. We can't do anything to get God to do it. He has given it to us freely simply on what Jesus has done for us and our faith not our works, our faith in Jesus. And so now to all of a sudden add the condition that you have to forgive other people in order for me to forgive you doesn't seem to make sense. So what is Jesus saying here? Commentators have wrestled with this literally for 2,000 years. I'm gonna do something that I think many of you that, are, that love Scottsdale Bible because we're a Bible teaching church are gonna appreciate. We're just gonna take about five to six minutes to do this, but it, it, it's the meat of our message time today. I'm going to give you the the three primary views that theologians have come up with over the years to try to make sense of what and why Jesus says what he says here. And here are the three primary views. I'll just put them up here for you note takers to uh, write down. Uh, The first one is what we're going to call the classic dispensational view. Don't let that word throw you. We'll explain that in a minute. Uh, The second one is the attitude versus action view. And then the third one is called the justification versus sanctification view. And obviously, I'm going to vie for one of these here in a minute, but the, we have to go through all of these just for me to, to show you where theologians have tried to make sense and how they've tried to make sense of Jesus' words. First, the classic dispensational view. This view simply asserts that the words of Jesus here are in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and that the Sermon on the Mount was given right on the tail end of the law, which is why it contains this really high moral standard. So they see it as part of the law, and that Jesus came, you know, to fulfill the law, but we don't have to obey the law anymore. We're now under the age of grace. And so they argue that everything in the Sermon on the Mount, including the stipulations in the Lord's Prayer, we are released from following. So they basically deal with this passage by saying it's such a high, moral, lofty standard like the Old Testament law that simply exists to show us that we are sinners and can't measure up to God, so it doesn't really count as far as our moral standard today. 
That's the classic dispensational view. Not all dispensationalists believe this, but the earlier ones did. Needless to say, I don't buy that at all. <laughs> I, I, I believe, one, that the moral law still needs to be obeyed for, as, for Christians. It still applies to us. And though the Sermon on the Mount is lofty, it's still part of Jesus' teaching and everything Jesus taught we need to obey and apply. So that's not a view I would hold. The second view is one that I've given a lot of thought to over the years. It's called the attitude versus action view. This was popularized by John Stott, one of the great theologians of our last century, as well as a guy named Mole, M-O-U-L-E, a commentator. And what they do is they try to make a distinction. Now, follow this, between the action of forgiveness and an attitude that we carry around with us that makes forgiveness possible. And what they propose is that Jesus is talking more here about an attitude of his followers rather than an action. So it's not like Jesus is really saying, you know, if you lack the action of forgiveness, God won't forgive you. What they're saying that he's saying here is that if you don't at least have an attitude that's willing to forgive, then you're in trouble with God. And that everybody who's a follower of Jesus would, of course, have that attitude. That's the logic behind this view. And again, it could be that this is what this is saying. There's only one problem with it, is that Jesus doesn't say anything like that here. (laughs) He doesn't make a distinction between an action or an attitude. He simply says that if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you, and forgiveness is that important. And so I don't think that's what's going on here. No, you guessed it. I'm going to vie for what is historically called the justification versus sanctification view. This view historically was held by John Calvin, the great reformer, and then also popularized by Charles Spurgeon, who was a great uh, 1800s preacher over in Britain and and had a lot of wonderful views on the Bible and the Word of God. And, And what they simply argue, and this will be rich for a lot of us who are into the Lord's Prayer here, what they argue, now don't miss this, is that the Lord's Prayer is a sanctifying prayer. In other words, it's a prayer for those who are already saved. The Lord's Prayer is not a prayer for our justification or our salvation. When you look close, it's a prayer that those who are already saved pray. It's a prayer for our growth, our intimacy, our sanctification, our holiness in the Lord. It's not a prayer having to do with our justification. It's a prayer that assumes that you're already justified and believing in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And so what they point out is that the forgiveness being talked about here is not eternal forgiveness It's not a forgiveness that saves you because that's already been done if you believe in Jesus. No, it's more of a daily, ongoing, relationship-making or breaking type of forgiveness, a sanctifying type of forgiveness that Jesus is talking about here. And so again, to clarify this, it would make verses 14 and 15 read this way. And I'm going to take a little liberty here, but just follow along. Jesus is speaking. He says, if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So your current relationship with him will be intact, everything fine. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive you. In other words, there will be a strain in your relationship with him. It will be stressed even though you're still saved. And even though you're a part of his family, and even though you're still guaranteed eternal life. Please see, gang, it's the difference between justification and sanctification. And they argue that the forgiveness being talked about here is a sanctifying daily type of forgiveness that we have with God. Now, I think this last view though all of them might have some merits, is the best way to make sense of Jesus' words here. I really do. Here's why. When you look closely at the Lord's Prayer, and this should be an aha moment for some of us, it really is a sanctifying prayer. It's a prayer for Christians. In other words, it's not the sinner's prayer. This is not a prayer that you pray to lead somebody to Christ. This prayer assumes that somebody has already come to Jesus Christ. How do we know that? The first two words, give it away. Our Father. 
In other words, if you know the Bible, you can't call God Father unless you've come home to him in Jesus Christ. I mean, you can. It just won't mean very much. It'd be like me walking up to a stranger and saying, Daddy. That wouldn't be very meaningful. But, but you, if I walk up to God and say, Father, there assumes a relationship with him. As the Bible says, for those who have believed in Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. We now call him Abba and Father. So the very first two words of the Lord's Prayer say, clue us into the fact that this is a Christian prayer. It's for those who are already following Jesus. So everything else then follows suit. That's why we say he's in heaven reigning. That's why we say he's holy and hallowed. That's why we say, as Kevin taught us, that his kingdom come because we are more in love with his kingdom and his will than anything else. That's why Rustin taught us last week that we pray, give us today our daily bread. It's not about our, our wants, it's about our needs and you'll give us each day what we need. You see, this isn't a salvation prayer, it's a sanctifying prayer. And the reason that's important is that then when we get to this idea of forgiveness, we begin to understand that the type of forgiveness is not the type of eternal forgiveness that, the, that, that justification and salvation is about. It's a sanctifying forgiveness, that daily forgiveness that we need with God on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And so now, and only now, are we ready for our main point when it comes to Jesus' teaching here in the Lord's Prayer. And it's a sobering point, but it's true. And if you will allow it, it can free you up more than you've ever thought. It can be very, very, very life-giving. And here it is. And that is that Jesus is telling us in this prayer that unforgiveness, when we harbor unforgiveness, it erects a barrier between us and God. <laughs> you see, we think unforgiveness erects a barrier between us and the poor sod that hurt us, which it does. But even more than that, what Jesus is teaching us here in the Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer is that unforgiveness erects a barrier between us and the Lord. It's a fellowship that we have with him that is broken when we refuse to forgive. Forgive us our debts, God, as we also have forgiven those that have debts against us. We're marrying the two together. And conversely, when we don't forgive, God says, I still love you. You're still in my family. You're not going to hell for that. But we got some work to do. <laughs> and our relationship is gonna be strained as long as you're treating other people that way. You know, probably the best example I can give you guys, and I've done this a lot over the years to help us understand that this is how God functions is the example of our own children. So if you have children at home or maybe grown children or grandchildren, uh, you understand what I'm about to say. And the question is, have your children ever disobeyed you? <laughs> have they ever rebelled against you in either small or big ways? And the obvious answer to that is yes. If you have teenagers, it happens regularly. If you have even little toddlers, they can be a handful and our kids disobey us and they rebel against us. Now here's, we have to wrestle with this. When they do this, do you look at them and say, get out. You're no longer a part of my family. I can't believe that you disobeyed me that way. There's the door, leave and don't ever come back. Only a completely moronic, cruel parent would say that. We don't say that to our kids when they disobey us. In fact, if anything, we say the opposite. We kind of draw them close and we want to, to, to make sure they're a part of the family because we want to teach them how to obey and be better. But, but here's what you need to wrestle with. When your kids obey and when they disobey greatly and even for a long period of time, does that create a strain on your relationship with them in the moment? What's the answer to that, yes or no? Yes. Of course it does, because you know that as long as your kids are disobeying you and doing things that you have said not to do, that's going to create an immediate strain. And though you forgive them in the long haul because they're your kid, in that moment, the first thing you don't say to them is, I forgive you. <laughs> the first thing you say to them is, we got to work on this because we've got some problems right now in our relationship with the way that you just treated that other kid or whatever the issue is. And here's what you need to wrestle with. Could it be the same with God? Because I think it is. In fact, I don't think it's different at all with God. But when you and I refuse to forgive, or at least as we'll see in a second here, embark on the road toward forgiveness, 
Though our eternal destiny is not in jeopardy, our daily, ongoing, sanctifying relationship with the Lord is. And that's hard enough to palate. And more Christians need to understand that. You know, some of you right now are going stir crazy at home. We've been praying a lot for you. I know this is tough. We're hunkering down and it's going to be a Uh, hopefully a a temporary thing, short-lived, but who knows how long it will be. We're going to keep everybody posted week by week. And and yet one of the advantages to hunkering down at home is that hopefully we have more time to think about our lives and audit our experiences and even our walk with the Lord. I'm doing that a lot as I'm doing more reading and more quiet time with the Lord. And as you're doing that, some of you might wonder why your spiritual life feels kind of anemic, why it is that you're so angry, why it is that you don't have that joy that the Bible talks about, why it is that that you lack experiences with God that that you might hear other Christians talk about. And you're tempted to doubt your salvation, which if you believe in Jesus, don't do because he's got you. But maybe there is some areas or are some areas of your life in, in, in which you have just had this long-term dig your heels in disobedience. And God is going to use this time to wake you up to that. Maybe as you're sitting there at home or wherever you are, you realize that there are some relationships that that you have just said, I am not going to forgive. I'm not going to let go. And again, if I'm reading the Lord's prayer here right, in the middle of it, we say, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. But if we haven't, it makes it a hard prayer to pray. And even worse, the addendum that Jesus gives us is really hard to understand because now we do understand it. And that is that maybe that's why we're so miserable. Maybe that's why we're struggling to experience the Lord because he's waiting for us to finally be the people that he wants us to be. You know, I know it sounds harsh, but I I've been a Christian now for almost 40 years, a pastor for over 30, and, and, I, and I've experienced this, gang. I really have. I've shared a lot. In fact, I shared last time I preached about my dad and the strained relationship there, and though I'm, I'm well on the other end of it, I got to tell you, there was a period in the 1990s. In fact, I know what the years were because my mom, when she was alive, reminded me of them regularly from 1991 to 1994 where I didn't talk to my dad at all. And I actually told him I didn't want to talk to him. I just said that the way that, that I felt I was raised by you and I was in counseling and working through a lot of issues, I said was just so you know, contrary to the way that I as a godly man want to raise children. And because of that, I, I, I cannot forgive you. I, I cannot get over this and I don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> of course, my dad's so tough. He said, well, good. Whenever you want to, I'm back here. But other than that, I'm okay. And that didn't help. But it was really hard on my mom. And what I haven't probably told you is that it was also really hard on me, not just emotionally, not just psychologically. Counseling was helping with that. It was hard on me spiritually because I carried around with me, and we'll talk about this in just a second, these, these leeches all over my body of every hurt that I experienced with my dad, and, and, and I refused, I refused to actually let them go and, and really to do much about it. And during those years, I, I, God loved me, and I know that, but there were times I felt very distant from him. There were times I felt very miserable as a Christian. And, and I look back now, and I realize that when we harbor unforgiveness, many times it's hard to experience the Lord. Again, he loves you. He, you're in the ring with him, but maybe look at it this way. You're against the ropes, Let me say it very positively, because Jesus is positive in the Lord's Prayer here. Forgiveness is the atomic bomb in our love arsenal, and God is adamant that we learn how to use it. Our our spiritual and emotional health depend on it. Others' guilt and shame depend on it. And even God's kingdom, that's the point of the Lord's Prayer, depends on it. And yet, going back to our, our, our beginning statement, it's a lot easier said than done. So here's what I do. We have just about 15 minutes remaining. And, uh, and, and I want to wrap up today by sharing with you three, I'm going to call them uh, key things that I believe are crucial to moving toward forgiveness. Now, I got to give a big caveat here. 
I am not about to give you three easy steps toward forgiving. If you write somebody this week and say, hey, dial into Pastor Jamie's sermon. He gave us three easy steps on how to forgive. Man, that would be a lie. There are not three easy or any steps on how to forgive. It's a journey, it's a process as we're gonna see and we do it mostly with God. But there are three, <clears throat> at least, biblical principles that are time-tested that help us in learning how to forgive. So let me just wrap up by giving these to you. Here's the first one, and it's the starting place, and that is starting point, and that is to be clear when it comes to forgiveness about what you are doing. Be clear about what you're doing. In other words, know what forgiveness is and by then default or contrary, what it is not. And let me give you a, a good working definition of forgiveness so that we're all clear about what it is God is asking us to do. Forgiveness is this. It's not complicated. It's just hard. Forgiveness is letting go of a wrong committed against you. <laughs> I would say, give me a head nod that you all understand this. So the few here are at home, give me a head nod that you understand this because it's forgiveness. It, two key things, letting go and a wrong. Those two things are, are, are what make forgiveness possible. Somebody has hurt you. Again, not the 11 items in a 10-item line or cutting you off in traffic. A serious hurt. And you now are choosing to let it go. This is at core what the Bible means by forgiveness. I don't know if you guys counted yet or not, but in our passage before us today, Matthew 6, verses 12 and then 14 and 15, uh, in this passage, Jesus mentions the word forgive. I counted six times in three verses. Six times, three verses. It's the Greek word aphemi, aphemi. And I spent a lot of time with it this week just because I wanted to make sure I understood it rightly. I read articles on it, scholarly articles. I, I looked up all the Greek lexicons, which are like Greek dictionaries on it, and read articles in there. And let me just read you a, a compilation of what the best experts say this word meant 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, forgive, 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 in this passage before us. It means this, to leave, to send away, to forsake, to lay aside, to let alone, to put away, to yield up. You get the idea? What do all those have in common? It's a word picture in which something at one time was close and clingy, again, like a leech on your body, and, and, and yet you have chosen to take an action step to rip that off and get it away from you. That's forgiveness. You let it go. I hate it when people say forgive and forget. The Bible doesn't say anything about forget. Do we all understand that? In other words, forgiveness is not forgetting. I, I, some of you have said to me, you know, you, over the years, you know, Jamie, you're so good with names. You remember every name, and I do. I'm very good with names. I'm also very good at remembering everything someone has ever said to me. <laughs> so for those of you who remember your name, I also remember what you said to me. But here is what I'm also getting better at as I grow as a Christian, and that is letting it go. So I might remember it, but I don't hold it against you. I, I, I let it go because that's what forgiveness is. It, it's key to forgiveness. Now, here is a second key toward forgiveness, and that is that we experience God's forgiveness of us or personalizing it for you. You need to experience God's forgiveness of you. That's the second key toward forgiveness. So here's the deal, gang, and this is really important. Though being clear about forgiveness is the very first step, so you know what you're doing, what Jesus makes clear is that if you really want to forgive others, it will only come when you have truly gotten in touch with the extent and depth of God's forgiveness of you. And here's what's so cool about that principle. And that is that it is smack dab staring us at the face here in the Lord's Prayer. Look again at verse 12. It says, or Jesus says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, I need you guys to wrestle with something. Which comes first? Which do you think comes first? Is it that God forgives us or that we forgive others? See, forgive others. Again, if, if you didn't know much about the Bible, you'd be tempted to say at first glance here, well, we got to forgive others and then only when that happens will he forgive us. That's actually not how Jesus says it. He says in this prayer, he begins with God, forgive us our debts 
And then this is where translations get tricky. As we also have forgiven our debtors, which makes it sound like a past thing. It's not. This actually would better be translated, and this is how the, I think the old King James does it, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's actually not in the past tense in the original Greek. It's in the aorist tense, which simply means a completed action that can be past or present. <laughs> and so what it's really saying here is that God, please forgive us. And as that happens, we're gonna do our best to forgive others in their lives. The logic is, if you don't have grace yourself, you're gonna have trouble showing it to others. And this is why, and let's be very honest right now, this is a great time to do it. This is why there's a huge difference for a Christian between being forgiven and feeling or experiencing being forgiven. I, I, every Christian who believes in Jesus is in the first category. If you're a believer in Jesus here today, I can promise you, I could show you in the Bible here in just a second that you are forgiven and you're guaranteed eternal life. The problem is, is that we have a tremendous amount of Christians today who have yet to really grow up and in their experience base with God, feel forgiven on a regular basis. And so we have all these people walking around saying or knowing that they are forgiven, but never really experiencing it. And I think that's why we have such a difficult time forgiving others, because we know something, and that is that God has forgiven us and we need to forgive others. It's just that it hasn't gotten here yet when it comes to our experience base. And so you're saying right now, well, how do I do that? <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're stuck at home <laughs> because this could be a perfect time, as I said Thursday night in my video, for you to start carving out more time to bathe yourself in the word of God and an understanding that hopefully will get down into your heart as you spend a lot of time there and experiencing his amazing love for you and the forgiveness that he really has for you. Now, let me just share with you some passages that have ministered to me over the years when it comes to experiencing God's forgiveness of me. Psalm 103 verse 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he, has he, God, removed our transgressions from us. Wow. Nope, go back one. Wow. <laughs> as far as the east is from the west. Do you all understand how far that is? See, in today's world, we think of a globe. We think of a, a circular world, which is what it is. And so if you go east from west, eventually they're going to meet again because you go around the globe. In the Hebrew world, they thought the earth was what? Flat, because they didn't understand any difference back then. So when this was written, they were thinking as they wrote it, inspired by God, draw a line to the east, draw a line to the west, and guess what? They're never going to meet. That's how far God has removed our sin from us. And then this passage here in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. <laughs> so God doesn't remember your sins. Now, again, being a theologian, does God actually, you know, completely forget everything from the past? Of course not. But what he's saying is, is that I have ripped that leech off, I have thrown it as far as I can from me, and in a very real sense, I don't remember your sins anymore. Or how about this one, Isaiah 118, my favorite. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool, which was white or is white. So the idea is God wants to change the color of our soul, and he did that in the gospel. He now sees you as white. Over and over again, gang, the Bible says that if you're in Jesus, he's got you, you're forgiven, you are loved. And part of our experience with the Lord is to, is to do whatever we can to let that sink in. Talk to other Christians about it. Read books about it. Immerse yourself in the word of God about it. Get counseling as it's helped me over the years to deal with childhood issues that maybe blocked that. But all I know is that the more that I've understood how much God has forgiven me is to the degree that I'm able to actually forgive others. 
So we begin by understanding and being clear about what forgiveness is. It's letting go. It's getting it away from us. We then bathe ourselves in the experience that God has forgiven us in order to forgive others. And then finally and lastly, we have just a few minutes left. We need to honor the reality that forgiveness, and I've worded this very carefully, is usually a process. This will free some of you up. We honor the reality that forgiveness is usually a process. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean, and and, and this will hopefully help pull you in and take the edge off of some of the harshness of this topic, and that is that God knows that for some of you, Lord knows it's been for me, forgiveness might take some, a very long time. Especially the deeper the hurt, he understands that it might take months, even years, for you to let go and be able to move on. It took me years with my father. And, and, and again, it was hard work, but I got there. And, and God knows that. You need to understand that. And, and though he wants you to stay in the ring and continue to fight the good fight, he understands that our Christian experience is one of growth and one that takes time. And these passages have encouraged me over the years. 2 Corinthians 10, 15. Our hope is that your faith continues to grow. God understands that your faith is here. It's gonna be here a year from now. How about this one? 2 Peter three eighteen. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Here's what we need to understand. Forgiveness is a process. And for many of us, we need to free ourselves up to, to not you know, shrink back on our laurels, but to, to understand that it is gonna be a process that we need to work through and that that's okay. Closing story, one more thought, and then we'll be done. I'll never forget when this process thing was made real to me about 15 years ago in my last church, almost 20 years ago now. I was counseling a, a woman who came to me from our church, uh, actually a pillar in our community, and it was a very serious counseling session because she made an appointment, came in to see me, and confessed that she had had an affair on her husband. And again, they had young kids, and they were pillars in our community and in our church, strong Christian people, and I go, wow, that's very serious. And as she confessed this affair to me, after we talked a little bit about it, I said, well, we need to tell him, <laughs> meaning your husband, and she said, I know, and, and I want to, and that's why I came to you. But she said, I want you to, to do it with me. And, and of course, I thought, well, I'd rather not. <laughs> but I, I, as your pastor and his pastor, I, I'd be willing to do that. So she went home and, and somehow convinced him that they needed to come back and see me without telling him about what uh, that night. And I'll never forget meeting with them in my office that night. And in tears, she confessed to this affair on her husband. And what happened next, I I will never forget as long as I live, because what happened next is that he got very composed, and and he looked at her, and he said right away, very even-keeled, I forgive you. And then he said it again, I forgive you, just like that. And, And picture me over here, and he's there, and I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking to myself, I didn't say it. I don't think it can be that easy. (laughs) If I was in your shoes, and I'm a minister for crying out loud, and I've been a Christian a long time, I I don't think that that, I'm gonna give you benefit of the doubt that maybe, maybe you're like Billy Graham or something like that, and you have this, but I I don't think that, that I'd have that response. But I let it go, and we kind of talked about it and talked about next steps and wrapped it up. And I remember driving home thinking, gosh, I don't think it'd be that easy. That was at seven o'clock at night. 10 hours later at five in the morning, there was pounding on my door and, and, and my house in, in Chagrin Falls there. And, and my wife and I run down the stairs because even at a smaller church, that didn't happen very often. And we open up the door and there's the woman, the wife. And she's hysterical and she's in tears. And we invite her in. We say, what happened? And she said, well, my, my husband went home. We didn't say much, went to bed. And, and about an hour ago, he woke me up. He woke all five kids up. He dragged us down into the living room. He took our wedding picture. He ripped me out of it. And he looked at all five kids and said, your mother is a $10 Texas whore. And then he kicked me out of the house. And of course, I remember thinking right then, I thought he forgave you. <laughs> so much for forgiveness. But that also didn't surprise me. The story actually does have a fairly good ending. It just took a long time. 
I went back and talked a lot to the husband and found out that sure enough, he didn't forgive her. He was very angry and very upset and felt very betrayed as he probably should be. And when he finally got honest about what he was feeling, then over time, we talked about what does forgiveness look like. And he eventually forgave his wife because God is good. But initially, there's no time to fake it. That's not what God wants. He understands it's a process. And for some of you, it's going to be a process, and that's okay. Because as you hang in there with God, as you work the program, if you will, you eventually will get to the point where you'll be able to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Last thought. A lot hangs on this for the Christian community. It really does. Why do I say that? Because the Christian community, Christians, are the ones people look to in culture to be the most grace-filled, to be the ones to show them what love and Jesus and grace and forgiveness really look like. One of my favorite authors 30, 20, 30 years ago was a guy by the name of Philip Yancey. Read almost everything that he wrote, just very real, very rich, very deep. And at one point in his book, is either on church or grace, I can't remember which one, uh, Philip Yancey said these words. He said, I rejected the church for a time because I found so little grace there. I returned because I found grace nowhere else. (laughs) Yancey grew up in a very legalistic church, as some of you did, and he was so discouraged by church in his young adulthood, as many people are. And as he rejected the church and got real mired in culture, he realized there ain't any more grace out there. (laughs) So he came back to the church, and he's written books on grace. His most famous one, What's So Amazing About Grace, that changed my life years ago. And, uh, And I think he's right. The people out there are looking for grace. They're looking to be set free. They're looking for Jesus. And part of us is to be Jesus to them. And forgiveness is a huge part of that. I hope as we continue to work through the Lord's Prayer, these are the things that we think about in our very experience with the Lord. Why don't you guys bow with me and let's pray. And then Pastor Neil is going to close our time together. Father, I thank you for these very difficult but probing and powerful words of Jesus in which we dare to pray, God, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who owe us some debts as well. And so, Father, I pray that as we each give thought to our own life, as we audit our experiences, as we have more downtime now when it comes to this idea of our spiritual life, I pray, God, that you would do a work in our hearts and our minds. We all people in our lives, Father, that we have trouble letting go of certain things. And some of them are really, really deep hurts. And Lord, it's not gonna happen overnight. And some of us wonder if it could ever happen at all. But you are a God of miracles. You are a God of profound grace. And you've shown us the greatest grace possible, forgiving us of our sins so that we can spend eternity with you. So Father, I pray that as we each work through our own spirituality, our own walk with you, help us to be those who stay in the ring who work through these things so that we truly can pray and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.